Hello, and welcome to On Point. I'm Bijan Nasseray Pertusi. It's graduation season, and students nationwide will be reaching for diplomas. But with that diploma in one hand, many may find a load of debt in the other. The Consumer Finance Protection Bureau reports students nationwide owe $1 trillion in student loans. The average amount owed per college grad is estimated at $27,000. For these students, the motivation to get a job, and quickly, is strong. But jobs are hard to get in this struggling economy, even for college graduates. So some will be left without an answer to that dreaded question, what are you doing after you graduate? The Bureau of Labor Statistics says more than 11% of recent graduates are still looking for work. That's nearly double the rate of joblessness seen before the recession. On Point reporter Emily Davies spoke to CSUN students about life after graduation. Well, how do you feel about the job market right now? Uh, it's, pre it's pretty competitive, uh, I think, just because everyone's, well, not everyone, but there's so much education, and you need to have so much of it in order to be able to get a job, especially in accounting or in finance or kind of in any any type of degree. The population that I'm working with, um, it's, it's very needed, which is people who basically you're, you can find it anywhere where somebody can have a problem with communication, a disorder in communication. The, the economy is bad right now. Like, I have plenty of friends that that you know that graduate don't have jobs for like the first year but you know like eventually they find something so I mean I'm not really too worried. Does student debt scare you for when you have to go to graduate school? Right yes. Now? Okay. My sister's in graduate school so she's taking out the loans. Okay what do you think you're gonna do to try to you know avoid it? Yeah. Well I'm not sure I think I'm gonna have to take out loans like her. Do you have any student loan debt? Uh yeah. It's, I think it's a uh, city 20 grand right now, so um, yeah, principal, interest, and all that fun stuff. So yeah, it's, it sucks, but um, if you want to get a degree, uh, you're kind of forced, you know, to get some debt at some time. Now Emily Davies is here with more on the story. Thank you, Bijan. I want to welcome our guest here today. Um, I have CSUN Financial Aid Counselor Gregorio Alcantar. Then I have CSUN Career Counselor Daniel Levich. And then finally, we have LA Valley College Cooperative Education Professor Doug Marriott. Thanks for coming and joining. Thank you. Thank All you. right. So um, it's the season of graduations. And a lot of the students that were, are graduating um, in this season study during the recession. And uh, they probably were aware of the high unemployment rates. And I just wanted to see what you guys thought um, the jobs, job prospects were um, for graduating seniors. So we can start with you, Gregorio. Um, well, I'm, I'm hoping they're pretty good. I, I know that if they weren't, I know that students, uh, in terms of financial aid, if they, for example, let's say they borrowed, uh, they do have options where they can uh, postpone payment until they can get uh, their two feet grounded and actually find a job and actually get comfortable with uh, you know, by setting up a budget and getting ready for payments, but um, I, I know that that there's options for them that way. Gotcha. Okay. Well, I think that depending on the job sector, the outlook varies uh, fairly significantly. But I think the main thing to know is that there are jobs out there. Um, in many cases, you just have to find a way to make yourself more competitive to attain them. Okay. I would agree with Daniel. I think there's a lot of opportunities for students who have been developing transferable skills while they've been in college. I think uh, now is the opportunity for them to feel good about themselves for completing their degree, but also starting to quantify what skills they have, to start to do informational interviews, mm -hmm. to start to reach out to people and set kind of measurable, specific goals to little by little get, get towards a job. Gotcha. Uh, what would you say is the biggest challenges that new grads face? Well, I, I think the first one that I, I see is that they may not be aware of uh, how to start to take care of business. For example, one of the immediate issues I get from students is, um, okay, so I did borrow student loans. Who do I have to pay them back to? Um, who is my lender? How much did I borrow? I, I'm not even sure. And so the, the key thing is to ease that worry by letting them know where to start by finding this information. And it's pretty, pretty straightforward as long as I'm glad they ask, but it's pretty straightforward. Matter of fact, what we do here at CSUN is once we know the student is graduating, we notify them uh, during the spring semester or the last semester that they're enrolled by letting them know uh, 
you're going to be graduating. These are some of the things you're going to have to get ready for. And here's where you can start looking for this information. Yeah. I find that networking tends to be this sort of nebulous concept uh, to a lot of students. Uh, how do I network, network? Where do I network? Whom do I network with? And so really it's about both mining your existing network and building a network for the future and how you go about that using both uh, social media, existing contacts. Um, so I find, yeah, networking tends to be this sort of difficult hurdle to, to um, I guess, deal with. I've seen a challenge with some recent graduates in that often there isn't a course in college about how to get a job. And so there are skills like networking, interviewing, which can be practiced, informational interviewing, uh, improving your resume so you match it for the job you're looking for, mm -hmm. giving yourself credit for volunteer work or transferable skills that an employer might look at. And so there's resources that might not have been in traditional classrooms that students can start to access through career centers, through other online material, where they can actually practice and gain confidence so when they do have an informational interview, they make a positive impression and possibly that leads to a job opportunity. A lot of students are graduating with debt and um, what's a way that grads can overcome this get debt and um, how can future grads kind of prevent this debt? Okay, well if, if students um, either one have not borrowed or have borrowed a little bit, one way they can minimize debt is to look at other resources that are not, for example, loans or credit card, there is no stuff like that, for example, scholarships. In the last two years, um, through the financial aid and scholarship department, we've been pushing students to please apply for um, scholarships. Matter of fact, we've actually entered the social media ourselves by creating a Twitter account, a Facebook account, an Instagram account, just to get this information out there to students so they can go ahead and do that. So that's one of the ways uh, that they can go ahead and uh, uh, reduce that debt. Now, if they have borrowed, one of the other ways is just to actually know how to look in how, in terms of how much they've borrowed. There's a system called the National Student Loan Database System, which helps track how much you've currently borrowed. And one of the ways that it's so helpful is that if you keep monitoring that database, it can help you know how much you've borrowed up to this point, and it can ha probably prevent you from borrowing some more. Do you find that fear of more student loan debt um, prevents people who want to go and get a higher education through grad school and get that higher paying job and more prestigious job um, because of those debts? You mean like does it hold them back? Or, yeah. Oh, um, well, I guess it depends uh, where if a student is very interested in pursuing, uh, you know, advancing their, their career or getting an advanced degree, uh, they're going to go ahead and, and do it. Um, but I think one of the things that helps a lot is if the student is aware of where they are in terms of the debt. What kind of debt is it? Is it, for example, uh, responsible debt such as educational debt as opposed to maybe uh, unsecured debt like credit card debt, which could be kind of unmanageable. But, um, but if, if I don't know if they would be fearful of wanting to go uh, further on because of the debt. Gotcha. Okay. Um, and then this uh, question is for both of you. Um, what would you say is the most common mistakes that grads make in preparation for the workforce? And uh, yeah, you can start with Doug. I would say I've, I've seen that they don't customize themselves for certain positions they're looking for. And that goes with, with any job seeker. When they look for a job, there's a summary of qualifications. They need to match their skills and the positive qualities they have specifically to that job. Whereas if they're sending out kind of a blank template resume that isn't customized from that. I hear directly from employers that those don't even get a second look. So spending time to research and customize themselves for the position they want and then following up, following up with personal phone calls, going out of their way to find out the person's name, who they're going to interview with, writing a thank you note. Little details, I think, make a big difference to employers. Things like uh, spelling or grammatical errors on a resume still rate one of the number one reasons people don't get, get a position. And then when they do get the interview, actually practicing and prepping for the interview. Yeah, I, I think that's a great answer. And, and um, really to add to that, the idea of managing your online presence, um, so oftentimes um, you know, an employer may want to do a Google search, find out a little something about you. Um, if you're if your online presence isn't what you want it to be, then you've done something wrong. And I really feel like 
taking the time to work on your privacy settings, um, get to know your privacy settings because they seem to change, you know, month to month, um, depending on whatever social media platform you're using. And I think that when an employer Google's your name, if the first thing they see is your Facebook page, if the first thing they see is your Facebook page and it's just locked up and you can't get into it, there's a sense of frustration that's going to come. So what you're going to want to do is manage that by sort of inundating the internet with positive things about yourself, your LinkedIn page, possibly your on online portfolio, things that will come up in the top two or three searches. It may not be the first. Facebook's probably going to be the first. But beyond that, you want things that they're going to be able to open and see something about you. And the beautiful thing about LinkedIn and online portfolios is that you get to control what they see. And um, I think really, yeah, managing your, your sort of online presence. OK, that's actually a question I was going to ask. And Moving on with that, um, how would you say would be the best use to um, advance your career? Because I mean, a lot of um, a lot of people who hire um, candidates, they'll look on, you know, they'll do the Google right. search. What is the best way, do you think, to make people make yourself look the best as a candidate? Um, I love utilizing my LinkedIn page. I'm a, I'm a huge advocate for LinkedIn uh, and any number of really professional um, networking sites that are out there. Um, so often, I see students say, oh, I've got a LinkedIn page. I'll ask, how do you utilize it? Well, I just sort of thought it was my resume online. Well, there's so many ways you can use it for both networking and to build a professional presence. You know, it, it's sort of the difference between you going to an employer and saying, I'd like a job, and hoping that, that they're hiring, and an employer coming to you and saying, this is the person that we want. How do we contact them? And so really building your social media platforms, building your LinkedIn presence, and using it as a forum for you to express your opinions about the industry that you're in. Um, and I'll, a lot of time, I'll hear students say, it's an industry I'm looking to get into. Well, I, I tend to recommend, don't look at it like that, but look at it like an industry that you're already in and act as such. Post content contributing to that industry. What would you say a good cover letter and resume would look like? Just a, an overall. Um, obviously, it's going to affect or depend on uh, what field you're going into. But what would you say, kind of overall, what a good cover letter and resume should look like? Um, and we can start with Doug. I think it should be should be very clear. It should be well organized. It should have numbers that quantify skills. So when people say I'm a team player. That doesn't really mean anything unless that you can say I've led four teams of six people to contribute to a reduction in cost by X amount. People's eyes tend to stop at numbers, so it should quantify certain skill sets. The cover letter shouldn't be, and this ver this is this varies depending on the job and the industry, but in general shouldn't be over a half page. Mm -hmm. It should show that the the job seeker has done research into the company and that should be identified in the cover letter. They, they should match kind of in style and, and format. And they really should be customized for the opportunity that the person is applying for. Yeah, I, I can't emphasize enough how important it is, I agree, to customize your resume. Um, I see so oftentimes students will say, I sent out a thousand resumes. I say, wow, you took the time to customize a thousand resumes? Well, no, I sent out the same resume to every single company. And, and it shows. It shows that you didn't take the time, you didn't take the effort, and ultimately employers want to work with people who are passionate about that specific job, that specific company. And so customizing it is absolutely critical. Uh, in addition to that, I've seen a lot of overly dense resumes, um, <clears throat> and I think that it still needs to be aesthetically pleasing. If it's not, then unfortunately there's a lot of time where I think uh, employers or HR representatives will look at it and say, I don't know that I want to read all this. It still needs to look appealing to the eye. I think the last data I saw said that, in general, it was a, this was an employment survey of employers in Southern California, that it's 30 seconds or less that people spend on resumes. Right. So I agree with what Daniel shared. I would also share for, for new graduates that it, it's very helpful when they meet people in the industry that they want to go into, whether it's broadcast journalism, whether it's the medical field, that when they do informational interviews with people that they ask the professional to look at the resume and what happens often is that the person says well why don't you look at mine mm -hmm. and when they see some somebody's resume that has a position that they might want to have 
they start to see the vocabulary, the language, yeah. the format, how things are quantified, because resumes really are industry specific. An educational resume looks very different than an entertainment resume. And so when you start to see people's resumes from the field you want to go into, I think that's helpful when students quantify their skills. Okay. Yeah. And um, what would be an example of customizing the resume? What would you change? Let's say it's um, a medical student and they're applying for the similar jobs. What would you say to change and make it customized for that job? Well, I think one of the um, one of the things you have to do now is be able to get past the computerized gatekeeper. And so a lot of uh, companies employ this sort of uh, guardian at the gates that are sifting through resumes and putting them in, you know, the level two res the level two pile or the the trash pile. And one of the ways they program this computer is by using key phrases, key words that they're scanning and looking for. And I think looking at the job description and pulling from that specifically will help you get past that sort of first level. Gotcha. Okay. Actually, one thing, I, if I can add, Definitely. is um, one way to practice, because uh, this is very important, is uh, especially if there's any upcoming graduating seniors soon or that are watching, but um, scholarships, mm. when you're applying for scholarships, basically what they were mentioning right now, that's kind of the, what we look for in, when you're applying for scholarships in terms of following directions, uh, making sure that uh, you're answering the questions, you are tailoring them specifically for the scholarship of your project because we have a new um, system uh, called Stars Online where you basically put in a profile and then you can send them off to different scholarships, but the catch is that you just can't hit a button and then they will go to all the different scholarships. You have to pay attention to every scholarship, answer their specific questions, and then answer them tailor them to that specific thing. And I think that's a good way to practice as well, just because it's not that far off from what they've been talking about in terms of uh, cover letters and resumes. It's very true, very true. How important would you say internships are, um, Doug? Huh? Depending on the industry, um, internships are, are very important. There's an expectation in certain industries that students have done two to three internships prior to completing their degree. and. Most data shows that students who have done internships, that their starting salary is upwards of 10000 more per year than a student who hasn't done an internship. Often when employers, prospective employers, look at internships, they see quantifiable skills, they see that the student already has a certain level of professionalism because they've spent multiple semesters in the industry. So I would say they're, they're very important depending on um, how students utilize them and how they quantify the experience. Uh, a student needs to be able to have an elevator speech about what they learned in their internship. Uh, sometimes I meet students and I say, wow, you did that, that was a great internship, what did you do? And that's something to practice as well. You want to quantify, I worked on this project that had this budget and I learned these skills, you know, rather than kind of a general answer. So I would, I would say they're, they're fairly important. Um, I see now many students doing internships after they have their degree as a way to get their foot in the door. So it can be done, ideally it's done during school, but if not, it can be done after. Um, I think that also structured volunteer work with a nonprofit, if it's, a, if it's an organization that a student cares about deeply, I think that translates well because when people talk about what they care about, they share more of themselves. So if a student has done volunteer work, with the nonprofit and they can quantify what they've done, I think that's very helpful as well. But I, I do think internships are important. Um, let's see. And going along with networking um, and internships, that, you know, that's a great networking opportunity. Um, this can be for all of you. What would you say is the best way to keep in contact with those sources that you can use and not, you know, send an email or, you know, talk, like how would you talk with them? How would you have someone? I, I think the key to, um, to networking with someone that you've either worked with in the past or that you've internshiped with in the past um, is regular contact. If you haven't seen them or heard from them in about a year, it might feel incredibly awkward to throw out, throw out a letter. I think that if you maintain regular contact, you know, give them updates on what's going on in your life, um, I think it's a great way to sort of naturally transition into using it as part of your network and ultimately finding a job.
And I think also um, starting with uh, the people in the places you know. So for example, at, in the financial aid uh, and scholarship office, uh, we're so happy that students are moving on with new endeavors and things like that. But if they have any questions regarding uh, anything that either pertains to maybe a student loan that they borrowed or, or um, aid for the future, they can always come back and talk to us and, and uh, we'd be happy to uh, help them out because they've already established a relationship uh, with the school and in this case our office. and. Uh, we're there to help them in anything they want to do. Gotcha. I think employers um, really often focus on soft skills. And soft skills mean different things to different generations. And so if a student is doing an internship and with somebody from a different generation, often a handwritten thank you note goes a long way. And um, I would also advise students, too, to ask for, with that same generation, a, a letter of recommendation at the time though when it's most present in the employer's mind whether it's during the internship often I go out and visit the employer and say how did the student do and it's fresh in their mind that the student had these qualities and if they take the time to put it on a general letter of recommendation that becomes part of the student's portfolio so when they do reach out again they can say it meant a lot to me when you said this about me when I did this internship and it helps to add to their employability. One of the things that uh, graduates don't have is real work experience a lot of times and a lot of interviewers um, are uncomfortable with hiring them because they don't know if they can keep up with the time pressures or um, any real world work experience. I think it, it takes time to to prepare yourself but also to sit down and really reflect on the skills that were built while the the interviewee was in college. They met deadlines, they navigated a complicated system, they worked with different people. They took different coursework. At the they might have done volunteer work. So it's really quantifying and thinking about skills that a student might have that they might not even give themselves credit for. Mm -hmm. uh, I, I have a, a, an example where a student studied to be a nurse. And to put herself through nursing school, she had worked as a, a server at a restaurant. And that's work that I've done. And you learn a lot from there. And she debated whether or not to put it on her resume. Right. And so you look at. <clears throat> what an entry-level nurse needs to do, and they need to be good with people, they need to follow directions, they need to follow safety protocols. Many of the things that this student had been doing for three years while working to put herself through school, she had developed those skills. So it's a matter of looking at, looking at that, putting it down, and then being able to share how they connect and fit the job, even in areas they might not have thought of. You know, transferable and soft skills are very important, and people get those in different environments. Yeah, I think the best advice that I've heard regarding interviews was simply give examples. Give examples. For every question that I get, I try to think of some example, some story that can relate a personal experience to the answer. And I think giving examples really shows and really hits that point home um, regarding soft skills. Gotcha. Okay. Um, well, my final question, um, what was something, and this is for all of you, what would be something that you, what advice would you have wished you would have had as a freshman, um, incoming freshman, preparing for your workforce, and then as a graduating senior going into the workforce? So we can start with you, Gregorio. Um, let's see, well, let's, let me think about that one. I, uh, if I knew then what I know now, I would say is, uh, Maybe learning more about, for example, uh, scholarships, um, understanding the importance of what are the real costs of college, um, understand that there are certain expenses that you must you know, have resources for to pay, and then others you can kind of budget, budget, and actually that would have been very helpful, learning how to budget the importance of uh, uh, managing uh, your expenses, spending on what is needed, not what you want. And uh, I think that that would be very helpful. Okay. And then how about going in as a graduate, um, coming out into the workforce? Um, let's see. Well, um, I really can't think of anything on top of my head right now, but uh, just, I guess, the importance of uh, uh, knowing where to start, uh, knowing what questions to ask, and, uh, and then just going for it. Great. Thanks. Um, I think as a student, I wish, I'd, I wish I had sought out a mentor. 
And I think a mentor is so such a valuable resource, uh, really for two reasons, and really for a plethora of reasons. But two two that I'd like to focus on are the advice you're going to get in its rawest form is is absolutely invaluable. And and two, you've got an advocate now. You've got somebody who's putting their neck out for you. Somebody who can give you names to speak with in your field. I mean, that to me is really the essence of networking. You've got somebody who's willing to recommend you for, for a position because they know you. And as far as um, upon graduation, really, utilizing my career center, um, really both through school and, and as alumni, using my, utilizing my career center. We have panels. We have um, workshops, Resumania, Interview Frenzy. We have uh, an online application called Pathways that really lets you both explore um, you know, career possibilities and help you uh, with practical applications for it. Um, really just using my career center. Okay. Doug? So the, it was for an incoming? As an incoming freshman preparing for college, or, and then as a um, graduating as senior an going out of the workforce. OK, I wish I would have been told early on about the value of experiential learning if you have the choice between writing a paper and doing 20 hours of volunteer work and keeping a log, do the volunteer work, in my opinion, because that opens up different doors. You meet people in the workforce. You start to develop skills. So I wish I would have started doing volunteer work earlier in my undergraduate studies. And then getting out, I would agree with Daniel, about utilizing resources that are there and knowing that these are skills that we develop over time. People aren't born good at interviewing. They mm -hmm. practice and they get better. People aren't born good at networking. Right. They practice and they do it. And so setting kind of measurable, specific goals and challenging themselves with the checklist to go out and say, I'm going to meet 10 people in the field this week. I'm going to send them thank you notes. I'm going to practice this. Because that's where jobs are really found rather than okay. perhaps traditional ways where they might be lonely and get discouraged by sending out resume. It's really the interpersonal part. So developing interpersonal skills in any capacity that they can, I think will be very helpful. Great. OK, and that's all the time we have. Thank you so much, gentlemen, for joining me today. Thank you for having Thank you. us. Thank you. Turning a 20-foot wall into a canvas takes vision. So we're getting into college. I've got what it takes. So do you. We would all like to thank you for tuning in to On Point. If you would like to see more of this, you can follow us on Facebook by searching CSUN On Point. And follow us on Twitter at CSUN On Point, all one word. This show also appears on our website at CSUNTVNews.com. Or catch us here every Sunday at 4 o'clock. For all of us here at On Point, I'm Bijan Nasrae Pertusing.